Surrender is not a popular word, is it? It's almost disliked as much as the word submission. It implies losing and no one wants to be a loser. Surrender evokes unpleasant images of admitting defeat, forfeiting a game, yielding to a stronger opponent. The word is almost always used in a negative context. But in today's competitive culture, we're taught to never give up never give in, so we don't hear much about surrendering as a positive term. If winning is everything, surrendering is unthinkable. We'd rather dwell on winning, succeeding, overcoming, conquering, not yielding, submitting, obeying or surrendering. So it's ironic that surrender is at the heart of the Christian faith. On Palm Sunday, Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem, not a horse. He came in peace, not war, to surrender, not to conquer. Jesus came to give his life as a ransom sacrifice, to be the Passover lamb, to make atonement with God. When some in the crowd laid their coats on the ground, it was a sign of their surrender to him. That's because surrender is the natural response to God's grace and mercy. Our surrender is called many things in scripture. It's called consecration, taking up your cross, dying to self, yielding to the Spirit, presenting ourselves as living sacrifices. What matters is that we do it, not that we, what we call it. Now, there are three common barriers to surrender to God. They're fear, pride and independence. And they're each addressed in our epistle reading for this Sunday, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. The first is fear. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. See, trust is essential to surrender. We won't surrender to someone unless we trust them. But we won't trust them until we know them well enough. Fear keeps us from surrender, but love casts out fear. The more we discover how much God loves us, the easier surrender becomes. How do we know that God loves us? He gives us many evidences. In Psalm 103, for example, the Lord says, As a father has compassion on his children, so is the Lord compassionate on those who fear him. From everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. Psalm 103, verses 13 and 17. The greatest expression of his love is seen in the sacrifice of Jesus. Romans 5.8 says, God proves his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So if you want to know how much you matter to God, look at Jesus Christ with his arms stretched out on the cross. God isn't a cruel slave driver or a bully who uses brute force to coerce us into submission. He doesn't try and break our will, but he breaks our heart so that we might respond freely to him. In scripture, God is revealed as a lover, as a liberator, and surrendering to him brings freedom, not bondage. So the first barrier is fear. And perfect love casts out fear. The second barrier is pride. 
Paul goes on, verses 3 to 5. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, 3 to 5. Notice that word same, the same as Jesus. Surrendering to God is not passive resignation. It's not fatalism. It's not accepting the status quo. It may mean the exact opposite. Surrendering is not for cowards or doormats. Likewise, it doesn't mean giving up rational thinking either. God wouldn't waste the mind he gave you. God doesn't want robots to serve him. Surrendering is not repressing our personality either. God wants us to use our unique personality. C.S. Lewis put it like this. The more we let God take us over, the more truly ourselves we become. Because he made us. He invented all the different people that you and I were intended to be. It is when I turn to Christ, when I give up myself to his personality, that I first begin to have my own real personality. A real personality of my own. So to surrender is to obey in love. Surrender says, yes, Lord, to whatever he asks. To say no, Lord, is a contradiction. You can say no, you can say Lord, but you can't say the two together in the same sentence. We can't call Jesus our Lord and refuse to obey him. After a night of fishing, the Apostle Peter modelled surrender when Jesus told him, try again. Luke 5 verse 5 says, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I let down the nets. Surrendered people obey God's God even when it doesn't appear to make sense. Abraham, for example, followed God's leading without knowing where. Moses waited for God's perfect timing without knowing when. Mary expected a miracle without knowing how. Joseph trusted God's purposes without knowing why. The Bible says in Psalm 37 verse 7, Surrender yourselves to the Lord and wait patiently for him. You see, we are called to surrender before we understand why. You know that you've surrendered when you don't react to criticism. When you don't rush to defend yourself. Surrendered hearts show up best in relationships. We don't edge others out. We don't demand our rights. The supreme example? Well, it's there in Philippians 2, 6 and 7. Jesus, who, being in very nature God, didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Nothing. Jesus was comfortable in being nothing. The night before his crucifixion, Jesus surrendered again. He prayed, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Luke twenty-two forty-two. Jesus didn't pray, Father, if you're able to take away this pain, please do. Instead, he said, Father, if my suffering fulfills your purposes, that's what I want to. Jesus agonised so much over God's purpose that he sweat drops of blood. Surrendering is not for wimps. The first barrier to surrender is fear. The second barrier to surrender is pride. And the third barrier, the third barrier is is independence. Philippians 2 verses 10 and 11. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth 
and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 10 and 11. So the third barrier to surrender is independence. We don't want to give up being in charge. It's the oldest temptation. Back in Genesis, Satan promised, you'll be like God. That desire to be in control is the cause of so much stress and conflict. The power struggles all over the world are merely graphic examples of the wider struggle between the Creator and His creation. We all know climate change is happening. We all know we've got to make changes, but no one's willing to make the changes. Life is a struggle, but what many people don't realise is that our struggle, like Jacob's, is really a struggle with God. We want to be God, and there's no way we're going to win that struggle. Ironically, when we try to be God, we end up like Satan, who desired the same thing. When faced with our own limitations, we react with irritation, with anger, with resentment. We kick, we fight back. We want to be taller or shorter, younger, fitter, smarter, stronger, more talented, more beautiful and, of course, wealthier. We want to have it all and do it all and we get upset when we can't, when others stand in our way or it doesn't work out the way we planned. And when we notice that God has given other talents to people we don't have, we get envious, we get jealous, bitter. So if fear, pride and independence are barriers to surrender, what are the incentives? What are the incentives to surrender? Well, the Apostle Paul includes them too. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fill fill his good purpose. You see, every one of us eventually surrenders to something or someone. If not to God, we will surrender to the opinions or expectations of others. We'll surrender to money. We'll surrender to fear or to bitterness. You see, we were designed to worship God. And if we won't, we find a substitute for worship. We're free to choose, but we're not free from the consequences of that choice. Surrender to God isn't the best way to live. It's the only way to live. Nothing else works. Because as we work out, as we live out the implications of our salvation, we discover it is God working in and through us. We cannot work out our salvation in our own strength or our own wisdom because salvation is a relationship, a relationship with our Lord and Saviour. And this isn't a one-time event. On another occasion, Paul said, I die daily. <clears throat> there is a moment of surrender when we trust in Christ for the first time. And there is the practice of surrender, which is lifelong and needs to be a daily experience. See, the problem with a living sacrifice is that it can crawl off the altar. That's why we have to re-surrender, perhaps many times a day. Whenever we confess our sin, whenever we seek God's forgiveness, that's when we're re-surrendering ourselves, realigning ourselves to God's purposes, beginning to follow Jesus again. This is why prayer is so important in our daily walk with the Lord. It's a communion, a conversation, depending on God for our wisdom. Lord, please give me wisdom, guidance and strength. You see, in this passage, we're told that one day everyone will surrender to Jesus. 
for now we may do so willingly, freely, not out of fear, but out of love. What better day than today to re-surrender to the love of God revealed in Jesus Christ. Amen.